Good evening, it's Grant Cameron here from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. I just returned home from a visit from Fredericton, New Brunswick, where I had a little more than five days to look at the files of Stanton Friedman. Um, I did one of these in New Brunswick before I left, but the uh, audio did not work. So I'm going to do this again. And I'm going to give you uh, just a brief um, introduction to the Stanton Friedman files, um, what I did there, what I found, and there'll be a number of these updates as I go through the files that I recovered. So I'm going to take over the screen and I'm going to give you a um, little update here on a PowerPoint presentation. So let's start this. Let's go to the PowerPoint here. And this is um, my presentation on the Stanton Friedman files. And this is an introduction update. I was there last Monday to uh, Saturday morning. And I recovered 58. I actually recovered about 6,000 pages. Of and I was using a camera for the whole thing. It's the fastest way. It's most of the arc people operating in the archives use cameras. So I was using a LG six. Um, I stood for forty seven hours, uh, bent over, and just shot one photo after another. Ninety nine percent of the people percent of the material I did not read. There's no time to read anything. You just photograph it and. Um, read it when you get home. Even then I won't really have time. It'll take uh, months to go through the material that I, that I uh, photographed there. Um, it led to a very sore back. I sort of um, remember back to staying at Sergio Lube's house in uh, Napa Valley in California. He had vineyards all around. He used to wander around in the morning in the vineyards. And I'd see these uh, Latinos working in there bent over and I used to feel so sorry for them that they do this every day of their life. I did it for five days and I actually had, didn't have to have painkillers. I didn't have any, but it was so painful. I, I really couldn't um, really stand because you're basically just standing in one particular spot for the entire time shooting. While I was there, there was actually more FBI files released by the FBI. Now, I filed the original FBI file, and I'm not sure why they didn't send it to me. They sent them to John Greenwald. But um, I will probably do a just one uh, PowerPoint update on the Stanton Friedman files um, from an FOIA that he first filed in 1985, and then I think again in 1988, and the one I filed and John Greenwald and probably other people's filed after uh, Stanton Friedman's death in May of this year. The files were actually uh, started before Stanton died. Um, they were working on these files uh, for a while. Um, Stanton had agreed to provide his files to the archives. And so there was a lot of work that was done before Stanton even died on these files. Uh, this is a flight out of Toronto into Fredericton. Uh, Stan would have taken this flight um, almost half or more times that he lectured. And if you, when you see his itinerary, I, I have photographed some of the itinerary that he did. Uh, he was on this plane an awful lot. Uh, he actually died in the um, Toronto airport. So this flight from Toronto to um, Fredericton was kind of a sort of a sacred flight. I was, you know, sort of following Stanton's footsteps in, in taking this plane that he had probably taken many, many times coming out of Toronto going into Fredericton. And when you arrive at Fredericton, they only have one gate. So here's me arriving in Fredericton and you actually arrive very, very late. I remember Stan used to be traveling all day and he'd lose three or four hours uh, flight time because it's actually on Atlantic time. It's past um, Eastern time. So this flight didn't come in until 1230 at night. And I was actually scheduled to be at the library. I had to be at the library or at the archives uh, nine o'clock the next morning. So Fredericton is actually a very, very beautiful place. 
Uh, there's a lot of these classic type homes that are around, um, very colorful, uh, very well maintained. And the, I was in the area around the university. I was staying uh, maybe about a 10 minute walk from the university. So this is the area sort of around the university. You can see very well maintained places. A lot of bright colors. And this was the place I was staying. Uh, this I had a one bedroom uh, suite in, in this place, which I would travel from every day to the university. This is the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick. This is where the files are held. Um, I give them extreme credit for taking on these files. As was explained to me, uh, the Provincial Archives is a place where people go to find their great-grandfather's birth certificate or death certificate or baptismal certificate or what land they owned or th these kind of things from New Brunswick. Uh, it is not set up for UFO files. This is the first time they've ever taken one. Uh, the other problem that there was in the archives taking these files is Stanton was not born in New Brunswick. His wife was from New Brunswick, but Stan was an American. Uh, so I would imagine there was some pushback in taking these files. Um, when you're going to see in a minute, these files this is a massive collection. And uh, they were working on it before he died. Um, the estimate I was given is a couple of years. Uh, they have three, I believe, full-time people working on this, on this collection. So if you take three full-time people for two years and you see how much money that is, uh, this is a massive investment being made in the UFO community. So I think uh, people should um, do whatever they can to thank the university for um, picking, up, picking this up for us and... Um, doing these files for us. This is the archives again. It's uh, on the, uh, the campus of the University of New Brunswick. And I think I have a video here of the university. This is, a, this is my, little, uh, my little place, my little desk. And this is sort of the archives room where you'll see a lot of um, different New Brunswick files on different things, different indexes and stuff. On the back wall there, you'll see uh, photographs from 100 years ago, piles and piles, books and books and books of photographs of uh, school photos and all this kind of stuff. This is the, uh, archi the little file folder thing there for indexing all the audiovisual material, microfilm stuff. And there was a lot of uh, public people in there looking up their ancestry. Uh, this is open to the public, so it was actually pretty busy of, of people coming in and uh, asking for stuff to uh, be looked at. This is the front door of the archives. Uh, this is my little desk where um, I actually had to keep my camera plugged into the uh, computer because it kept going dead. It was I was taking so many photographs that the camera was having a very hard time keeping up and the cord that I had wasn't long enough to go into the extension or to their their plug. So I had to plug it in the computer and it worked, but it didn't work. That one we've seen already. This is the outside. This is, um, I was at the University of Manitoba for 37 years. So this is what a typical campus looks like. Nobody's going very anywhere very fast. It's a lot of trees, a lot of big buildings. Uh, very, very beautiful, almost like uh, any campus, almost any big city I go in, I like to go on and wander around their campus. So this is uh, from the front door of the archives and you can see the buildings that surround it. This is, these are the full file door boxes that the material, um, it's all changed from the files that Stan had. Uh, they're put into new files uh, because a lot of the files were, Stan had researched for 61 years. So um, some of the files uh, were, there's a lot of humidity I seem to realize in uh, Fredericton and this was in the basement so there was um, some situations with mold so all the files were actually replaced uh, with new uh, file folders and some of the material is um, sort of under a, a process where they're um, cleaning it up and stuff like that. Uh, here's Stan, famous photograph of Stan with the looking at a microfiche micro or a microfilm reader and probably he was in an archives there as well or into the library or the uh, 
the uh, newspaper archives. Uh, this is Joanna. Joanna is in charge of the Stanton Friedman Collection. She's been nothing but helpful to me. Uh, basically asked me, what can I help you with? What can I do? And is actually um, willing to take from me uh, because she's coming up to speed on UFOs. I mean, these are people who have never done UFOs. So I offered to give her a list of, um, they have a, a file you'll see in a minute or their, their screening table where they have good guys, bad guys, because Stan had um, a lot of um, sort of debates with skeptics and there was people who praised them. So she had a file, good guys, bad guys. And um, so I'm giving her a list of who are the key uh, names that they should try to pull those as they're going through. And you'll see, you'll see what I mean in a minute, but they have to pull these, these names because they're going page by page. And when you see how big this collection is, all that stuff in the background there, that's all Stan stuff. Uh, that's all Stan stuff. And the problem with Stan's collection is um, Stan did a lot of lecturing, Stan did a lot of uh, touring around, and um, most of the collection is like this. It's just piles and piles of uh, documents and papers that were not in, in his 11 filing cabinets, I think he had. Uh, these are just boxes and stacks of paper that are stuck into boxes, and that's the thing. They have to go through this one page at a time, and they have to sort it out. Is this you know, a letter from somebody, is this uh, Phil Class's material, is this, it's, it's just a very long job. But the archive, uh, Joanna told me that I think she said she's been doing archives for many decades and it'll take her four hours to go through a box like this. This is a long, laborious job and a lot of uh, effort is being put into uh, trying to sort this by people who really don't have UFO backgrounds. There's another box um, on the table that they were actually working on at the time. Uh, Stanton Friedman's material, but you can see it's just newspaper articles and pieces of paper. And uh, there was even a piece of paper they're asking me, what should we do with this? Like just names drawn down on a piece of paper. And I basically suggested, yeah, you should probably just keep all those pieces of paper with people's names on them, even though they're not really sorted and keep them in a separate file because you never know, um, some researcher may find that of some use. Uh, here's the little uh, papers. Um, the big topics is one of the files. Uh, Stan promo material, Stan newsletters, and so they put, put them in these piles. So they would take a box and they would have all these different um, piles that they, they would make based upon on what it is and trying to uh, separate this uh, material. Uh, this is the uh, archives holding room. Uh, th this is a massive, massive, massive place. I mean, I don't know how many files they have in there, but you can see they're up maybe 20, 25 feet in the air with these boxes. They're all uh, computer coded so they can go in there, just um, they can scan, they know exactly which box is where it is. And you can see there's rows and rows and rows of these um, things. Part of Stan's collection is in there right now. Here you can see just this massive size of, of the room. Now this is a, a uh, pallet of boxes that arrived the morning that this photo was taken. I think this was taken Friday morning. Uh, this is Stan's stuff. This is uh, an entire pallet that had just been removed from the house. And to give you an idea how big the collection is, take this pallet of boxes, and multiply it by 15. That's how big the collection is. It's absolutely massive. It uh, took up three rooms. It took up the entire basement of Stan's house. And apparently his wife never went down there, but we already knew that she was really not interested in UFOs. So Stan, that was his, his place where he, for 61 years, collected material. And this is one of 15 pallets of material that they have to sort through. And most, as I mentioned, most of the stuff is just simple piles of paper that they have to go through one page at a time and figure out what subject is it? Where should it go? How do we file it? What box do we put it in? It's a massive, massive job. Uh, here's some uh, videotapes. I'll talk about this at the very end. Uh, these are videotapes from the 1960s with Merv Griffin, people like that. The Stan had collected literally everything and there he had a lot uh, of phone calls that were taped. Um, the girl that runs the audiovisual stuff was on holidays the week I was there. I'll be talking to her. Uh, the archives is prepared to make all this stuff uh, public. 
Now they don't have a, um, a website to do it. So um, some of the material um, I may be able to help them put out because they, they're really not set up to put up this stuff. And uh, with Stan, I mean, you're talking boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of uh, videotapes and audio tapes and all sorts of stuff that they are going to um, reproduce. But unless you go to the library, uh, you will have no access to the material. So I may be able to find some way to help them um, get this material, especially one particular thing that I'll talk about at the end, which they have already agreed uh, that I can help them uh, get out there. Here's me with the one pallet that had come in that morning and they still have some stuff to remove from the house. I think Stan's wife is, is uh, moving. So they still have asked for the awards. He received a lot of lifetime achievement awards and researcher of the year stuff. That stuff has not come yet, but uh, this was the last of the sort of files and audiovisual material that had been brought into the library, actually the morning that I was there. Um, a lot, one, of the, one of the things I found hard that you'll see, and people will be concerned about pieces of size of documents being cut off, Stan was very frugal. I mean, you would see a lot of uh, the typing that he did. He would actually use old uh, promo material stuff that he was selling tapes and documents and stuff like that and they came out of date or whatever so instead of throwing them out he would use them and he would type on the back side of those pieces of paper plus uh, Stan for you know big letters he would use you know wide margins but for a lot of the letters Stan did he went right to the margins it was actually very hard to photocopy a lot of the stuff because you either got part of the desk or you uh clipped off part of the the document because he, he really didn't use many margins it was actually a little bit difficult to try to um, photograph some of his material there are some cartoons I managed to capture a couple of cartoons there was some uh, pretty good collection collections in there and I have collected UFO cartoons for a little while this is one of the documents I sort of um, referenced on the internet on my Facebook site a few weeks ago, or like last week when I was doing it, and this is the uh, alien threat letter, the uh, death threat from the aliens. So I have to transpose this because you can see it's a very, very delicate letter. It's in plastic, and uh, I photographed it, and I will transpose it f for the Internet. So there's kind of those weird things. Uh, one of the biggest parts of the collection that I found that was in files, and that was the Area 51. Uh, there are literally hundreds of pages of Area 51 stuff. Stan spent a lot of time. Uh, he didn't believe the Lazar story. Uh, he was very adamant about it, but he did correspond with most of the major witnesses. There's a huge collection of um, letters with George Knapp, with uh, Gene Huff. Um, there's um, piles of documents from all the various court proceedings with the pandering charge and all this kind of stuff. Uh, the stuff when Stan tried to track down the um, uh, the two degrees from the two universities and stuff. Stan spent a lot of time working on this. This was one particularly interesting document. This was uh, Bob Lazar uh, writing to Los Alamos Laboratories asking for his files, which indicates that if um, um, Bob, Laz that Bob Lazar was trying to help George Knapp and everybody else um, try to get his material. So he... Um, had actually sent a letter asking for them to verify the fact that he had worked to at Los Alamos. And I have the response to this, which is basically, um, it, it may be more than one letter, but the one letter I did see said, uh, we can't find anything. So, uh, but this is a, a kind of a unique letter that I had not known about that, that Lazar had actually uh, written for the files himself. Uh, this is kind of one of the examples. The archivists actually found this stuff pretty funny too. Uh, for people who are very young, they really don't realize there's this big debate. There's there's always researchers fighting with each other. But in the 1980s, the big fight was between Phil Klass, Bill Moore, and Stan Friedman. And they were fighting over the MJ-12 document and a bunch of other stuff. And they were like a bunch of old uh, grumpy guys going at it. And they were very witty, uh, very sarcastic. And they would send these letters back and forth. And this is one example. This is uh, Bill Moore, who worked with uh, Stanton Friedman on the MJ-12 document, uh, replying to a letter from, from Phil Klass saying, as a matter of courtesy, I offer you the following response to your letter of July the 24th. Bullshit. Enough said. 
please do trouble yourself to provide some definite answers to the questions I have put to you. And these kind of letters were very, very funny. Uh, there was uh, Stan would write them. Uh, Phil Klaus was very witty. And these letters went back and forth. And I have recovered uh, uh, the vast majority of this stuff, although I did receive some of it was in these piles of paper. Um, but Stan always used to make the, the comment that Phil Klaus, um, and I, I was the one that discovered this, went to the Philosophical Society in Philadelphia to look at Phil Klaus's collection. And Phil Klaus had piles of letters with everybody you could possibly think of and files that he kept on people and stuff like that. And there was nothing on Stanton Friedman. And yet probably his biggest correspondence character that he had interacted with over the years was Stanton Friedman. So once I mentioned this, Stan used to talk about it in his, in his lectures and he said, uh, he may not have it, but I've got it in my collection. So that was one of the main things that I tried to recover, all the Phil Klaas collection. So uh, we now have the, the correspondence between Phil Klaas and Stanton Friedman. Um, here's one of Phil Klaas's uh, letters back. This is to Robert Collins and I've talked for two decades about the Avery, uh, which is this list of high level people who uh, Bill Moore had used in 1980s and they'd given them bird names. So Robert Collins was a physicist at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and he had this contact with uh, Stanton Friedman. Uh, he worked mostly with Bill Moore, uh, but here's Phil Klaas writing this really funny letter to uh, Robert Collins, the Condor, and this is during the same date. This is uh, just after they make the MJ-12 document public and uh, Stanton or uh, Phil Klaas writes, how terribly thoughtful of me to forget to write and thank you for the pivotal role in carrying out my li recent little sting operation to determine whether or not Moore at all, all had been prompted to promptly urged the National Archives to have the FBI investigate the authenticity of the Cutler Twining memo of July, 1954. Without your help, I could not have pulled it off. Who knows what other little stings may be planned or underway. For example, and he, and it goes on, but this is the kind of letters where you see these um, uh, things and then you, you get Stan re replying back about false claims. And here's one that Stan wrote uh, uh, to, Stanton Friedman writes to him and he writes back. And across one paragraph, nonsense. Next, next paragraph, false, nonsense, false. And they would do these things. They would make these comments. And, and uh, it was just a real battle of belief systems. And this all centered around this very famous MJ-12 document, which is now sort of vindicated, Stanley, because uh, this recent uh, Wilson uh, document um, with uh, that talks about... Um, uh, the uh, Admiral Wilson and the, this leaked document actually verifies the at the very end that yes, MJ-12 is, is very much for real. And this was the whole debate. Um, is this MJ-12 document real? I don't think the document was real, but I always said MJ-12 was real. And so this big battle about this MJ-12 group that reports to the president, the 12 top guys, was something that um, people who are new in the field won't know. This was a raging battle in the 1980s and it was all done by mail. There was no internet at the time. People were using snail mail to do it. A lot of the stuff I'll be releasing is just uh, um, newspaper clippings. Now, because these are from the past, people will think they're not that important, but there are a lot of Stan was following the events of the day. And here's the, this particular one where the DOD admits, admits secret space office and this was the uh, 19, early 1990s when the government makes public the fact that the National Reconnaissance Organization actually exists. Um, it had been kept secret for 30 years. The, the agency was around for 30 years and they didn't publicly announce that the agency existed till 19, uh, was it 1992? And basically when they made it public, everybody thought they were joking. They thought it was a, a, a sort of a scam because nobody could believe that this could possibly happen. So even when they released it, nobody believed it. Here's another one of the big skeptics that Stan used to fight with, and this is Donald Menzel. I found this uh, book called uh, Meet the Martians, and you got to remember we're talking back in the 60s and 70s here, uh, where the belief system still, it was not, it had nothing to do with uh, the Pleiadians and the Alpha Centauri and the Zeta Reticuli and stuff. It was still, we're talking about Mars and Venus. This is where these things were coming from. So the, the ideas were not as developed as they are now. And so here's uh, Donald Menzel 
doing art and drawing the Martians. And you'll see in this, in this book that he had where he draws them as, as completely different than humans. And this goes back to the theory of random theory of evolution, that it was just absolutely impossible. There were the odds of man being created with all the accidents that are required. Uh, it was impossible, but uh, learn to live with it because it actually happened. So one of the big objections to um, aliens in the um, early years, the 50s, 60s, from astronomers was that this could not possibly have happened again. It was impossible that you had one human being being created on a planet or through all these accidental uh, genetic mutations. And what's the chances that it could happen a second time and that the beings would look exactly like us? So what you'll see is Donald Menzel is drawing beings that look completely different like humans. So that was the basic concept that if there was ET life, it's not going to look like us. And actually, you see that it does look like us, and that would indicate that um, evolution occurs according, not to randomly, but according to patterns, like morphogenetic fields. If there's, there's oxygen in this part of the universe, there'll be oxygen in other parts. If there's stars here, there'll be stars there. If there's gravity here, there'll be gravity there. That there's a certain pattern that's being reproduced wherever you are in the universe. But in the 60s, uh, this, was, this was not believed. In the 50s and 60s, it was the idea that if, it lo if there was ET life, it would absolutely never look anything like us because of this random theory idea. This is one of the most important documents I'm going to, uh, shortly I'm going to do an entire presentation on this one document. Uh, we've been trying to verify, I've been trying to verify for many years that it's a 19... Um, 79 MUFON conference, uh, Ward Kimball had presented a film that Walt Disney had made in 1956, that Walt Disney had uh, been asked to do a documentary for the, US, for, the, for the U.S. government. And you'll see now people are putting out the idea that this is a conspiracy theory. Uh, there is no government disclosure operation. The government is not trying to get the information out. Uh, this is part of a documentary or a PowerPoint presentation I'll do that shows quite clearly that the government has been dropping this story forever. Uh, Ward Kimball was one of the nine top animators, the top, the one of the nine animators for Walt Disney, and he was absolutely fascinated with UFOs. And he shows up at the at the '79 Mufon conference, and he shows this documentary that. Um, Walt Disney had done. Walt Disney had been offered to do the documentary. They offered him film, uh, photographs, all this sort of stuff for the documentary. And when he was just about finished it, they came and said, sorry, we can't give you the film. Uh, and nevertheless, Walt Disney completed the UFO documentary, uh, but it really didn't get out there. So we've got a confirmation from this that there actually is a documentary, as we've always said. And now the question is, can we find this, this Walt Disney documentary? It was done in 1956. So the government has been contacting people like Walt Disney, Bob Emenegger, uh, Tom DeLong, a bunch of people, and found indirect ways to get a plausible deniability uh, story out to the public of what they know. Um, the other interesting thing about <clears throat> this whole thing is that Ward Kimball, um, was interviewed by Phil Mantle when he did his book on the, the, the alien autopsy. And um, the, um, during that, um, no, no, it wasn't, he didn't interview um, Ward Kimball. He interviewed um, a guy who, his name was Mike Maloney. He had won the top photographer of the year in Great Britain for three years. And Mike Maloney, um, had stated that in the 1970s, he had been in Los Angeles at the Disney Studios and that he had been taken from there, there to a private house and he had been shown what he claimed was the alien autopsy uh, video, which would indicate that um, the one that was made in 1995 um, may have been one that was reproduced. Uh, but it does appear there are a lot of witnesses who saw a, do a documentary that looked exactly like that. In fact, Maloney said that look, it was exactly the same, identical, except that his had a live alien on the floor in, in addition to the one that was on the table. And the interesting thing to that is that, my, here's Mike Maloney, 
the interesting thing is that is that um, when Phil Mantle interviewed Mike Maloney, he confirmed that it was Ward Kimball who had shown him the video, which I had already suspected because I had talked to Bob Emenager, who did the very famous documentary in 1975 called UFOs Past, Present and Future, in which he talked about getting complete cooperation from the government being approached by the government to do a documentary that they wanted he and Alan Sandler to do. They had gone to the Pentagon, they had signed an actual uh, film contract, like any other film contract they did, they did a UFO documentary, and that Bob Emenegger told me that he had dealt with Warm, Ward Kimball as well, when he was, because they were both in Los Angeles, and he said this, they did the same thing to Disney that they did to me. So Ward Kimball, we have not recovered his files yet, but Ward Kimball, we knew, I've known for many decades already that Ward Kimball was absolutely fascinated with UFOs and had a, a collection of various um, things related to UFOs. Um, talking about uh, film and photographs and stuff, this is a, um, an Easter uh, some, uh, Christmas card that was given to uh, Stanton Friedman from his daughter. And this must have been when she was very, very young, but her art is actually very, very good. And this was one of the highlights of the, uh, the week finding this, although it is marked in the, in the, um, in the archives indexes that, that this is in there. So this is from the daughter to Stanton Friedman. Uh, a lot of the stuff, as I said, is older material. Here you have from the 1977 MUFON conference. Uh, the big topic of the conference is will President Carter open up the UFO files? Because uh, in June of 1976, while running for president, Jimmy Carter had made an offer that he would open up all the UFO files except for national security files uh, for the people. And then he made the offer a second time in Wisconsin. So it was on the record that he was going to do some sort of disclosure thing. And this was the main topic uh, being brought up at the 1977 um, MUFON conference. Uh, this is a, um, I've already got this on my presidential UFO Facebook site. Uh, this is um, from the 1990s. This is a report on space activity in Zimbabwe. Uh, and Zimbabwe, I've got the first two is on the uh, events in September. And then the last two pages, this is a four-page document, is on the 62 school kids at, at the, uh, the school in, in uh, Zimbabwe who had the UFO land. And there's now a documentary that's about to be released on it. Uh, but this is a document from that exact period of time that Stan had in his files. And it's pretty extensive as to um, stuff that, UFO stuff that was going on in Zimbabwe at that particular time. Um, this was uh, one of the interesting things. Um, this is the box, you see the archives box and I'm going through. And in the one archives box, half the box was a, a stack of paper. This is part of the stack, but it was a huge stack of paper. One of these things where uh, it's just every subject under the sun and I have to go through it one page at a time and I'm trying to, I have to read a lot of this stuff to figure out what it is. Um, so um, I went through this and one of the key things, I found one of the key documents that I wanted when I went there and that was the top secret memo. Um, I, uh, Stan was one of the guys that had forced this memo out in 1978 and I think they declassified it in 78 or 79 and I had a copy of the document uh, but mine had given to Stanton Friedman on the top and stuff, and it had a bunch of markings on it. And I was trying to find a clean copy of the document. So Stan would always talk about this document because it's very famous. It's the probably the top UFO document of all times. The Canadian government is is stating that they had talked to American officials and were told flying saucers exist. It's the most highly classified subject in the United States. Uh, there's a group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush. It's of tremendous significance to the Americans and mental phenomena may be involved, which we now is only in the last couple of years. We started to look at this aspect written November of 1950. And the particular the strange thing was that Stan would always reference it in his, in his presentations, but he would never show the document. And I always wondered, he's got the document. Why doesn't he show the document? And that's because it's in that pile of paper. I guess he put it in the pile of paper at one point and uh, then lost it in the pile. So I found it in that pile of paper. And so now I've got sort of a clean copy. There's some notes from uh, Stanton Friedman after page three, but, uh, and after page two, or somebody else puts in note, Smith died in 62 of a brain tumor. He actually died of, of uh, lower bowel cancer, not of a brain tumor, but. 
Um, this was Mr. X. This was, um, I knew about this guy as well. He was the guy who helped Stanton um, push those documents out in the late seventies. Uh, people knew that there was um, files from the department of transport and this guy, from what I'm told, I'm not sure if it's really true, but had actually actually changed his name illegally to Mr. X. And so it was Mr. X and Stanton Friedman who were putting tremendous pressure on the government. And that's when they dropped the top secret uh, memo in the uh, files from the Department of Transport. And I don't think they realized that document was in there when they dropped it. Uh, this is a permit. This is one of four pages. I'll release the rest of the pages for a permit uh, to demonstrate outside the White House for UFO disclosure. You hear people in these days saying, oh, we should, you know, we need, wanna, we need to go, we're gonna storm Area 51, all this kind of stuff. Well, in the 1990s, the idea was to go to Washington and to demonstrate outside the White House. So this is the permit, and it was like, for, it was a four page permit, answering questions about what they were gonna do and stuff. Uh, the sad story is like all disclosure efforts, I mean, people talk about it when it comes down to doing things, nobody does anything. Uh, as far as I know, the times that they demonstrated a couple of times, they never had more than 20 people demonstrating outside the White House for UFO disclosure. So a lot of people talk about it, but when it comes to actually appearing and outing yourself to actually walk around with a sign, uh, nobody showed up. Uh, this shows Stan was very sort of old school. He was the last person uh, to go from slides to PowerPoint. I remember he used to say, I'm not, I'm doing my slides. I want my slide projector here. Uh, I'm not a computer guy and he would never do PowerPoint. And eventually he moved over to PowerPoint. But here you can see these are overhead slides. And a lot of the new researchers don't even know what overhead slides are. Uh, these were used in the early years and Stan, this is one of the lectures that Stan had with all these uh, overhead slides that he was using for the particular lecture. And Stan did lecture an awful lot. Now, this I think is the last slide, and this has to do with the audiovisual material. Um, the, you can see there's a lot of material. I'm going back probably every six months or every year, I'll go back to look at the new material to try to recover this. I've got 6,000 pages already. But the audiovisual material may be um, just as important, if not more important. Um, as I mentioned, all that material will be processed by the library, it will be um, done. And we will see um, how they get it out because their 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 archives is just it's just not set up for is for any files, let alone UFO files. Uh, they are a place that has uh, people's birth certificates, death certificates, uh, you know, county records, all this kind of stuff on there, and it's all New Brunswick stuff. So um, we'll see how if I can help them find some way to get something up. Um, on where they can put some of this stuff up. But in, in the end, people may actually have to go to the archives to see this stuff in Fredericton, New Brunswick. One of the things that will be released, they've actually uh, have it processed, they have it digitalized, and that is an oral history. If you look at any big institution, and I know uh, they do it at all presidential uh, libraries, except they may not do it at the Trump or, uh, White House, but in all the other White Houses, um, when you leave the White House, um, they do an exit interview, which is called an oral history. And they basically ask you, and I always use the example, if you're the, the chef at the White House, they ask you, what was it like to work for President Reagan? Did he ever come and steal food at two o'clock in the morning? What was his favorite food? And you go through all this weird stuff about what was it like to work in the White House? And who did you fight with? And who did you like? And all this kind of stuff. So just before um, Stan died, I'm not sure when the oral history was done, but it was done very late in his life. Um, they have an oral history and they have the, uh, somebody who's a professional at it uh, from the archives actually sits down with Stanton Friedman and goes through his entire life. So this may be the last interview or, uh, Stanton ever gave uh, and they have agreed to allow me to help get this thing out. I don't know how it's gonna get out, but the oral history is ready. And when it's, when it's available, I will let people know. And once again, this is the end of this presentation. But uh, just to let people know, um, I have just started to go mm -hmm. through the files uh, for, that I recovered last week. And this is, um, this is like uh, 30 books worth of material that, that I photographed. And I haven't read any of it, but uh, there's a bunch of interesting stuff that I will stick up. And I will do these updates from time to time to show you uh, interesting stuff. And if you watch my presidential UFO Facebook site, 
you will see um, daily stuff that I'll stick up there, various weird little documents that I found. So Presidential UFO Facebook site and the White House UFO YouTube site is where we will do these um, uh, PowerPoint presentations to bring people up to speed on the biggest uh, personal UFO collection uh, in the world uh, that's uh, at the Provincial Archives, the University of New Brunswick, in Fredericton, New Brunswick. So I want to thank everybody for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.